sort of intellectual property issues. He sits and has more positions than I can possibly list. So we're really grateful, Tim, that you've taken the time out to come and speak to us. So thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. And I might stand here and try and avoid the speaker as well. Well, thank you everybody so much for coming tonight. And Tim's right, today is a very significant day because we have seen the High Court make a decision which I have to say is entirely predictable, uh, but nonetheless I think entirely negative for the future direction of this country. Now, are there any journalists in the room? No? This wouldn't change for a second what I was going to say. I was just going to give you a nice quote so you could leave. But you are not. So you're all here. Uh, and uh, what actually disappoints me more is there aren't journalists in the room because you have here a group of people who have come together voluntarily, not just clicks on a GitHub page, who have come together to stand up for their basic freedoms and their basic rights, and it's completely ignored by the media. And I know Tim actually invited them all, uh, all here this evening. Uh, and I think today is a very key day because of the change in law or the uh, uh, upholding of the laws around plain packaging. Now a lot of people think this is about tobacco. It is not about tobacco. Before uh, I, when I arrived there was Fiona Patton here from uh, the sex party. Now the adult entertainment industry can tell you for a long time how plain packaging has basically been imposed on adult bookstores in this state and I'm sure in many other states. It hasn't disturbed people from accessing pornography, by the way. Uh, it has then been replicated in South Australia. There are now plain packaging laws on the books operating against R-rated 18 plus videos. That came into effect last year, unless those videos are separated from uh, sections where children can access them or uh, other types of videos. And now, of course, we have plain packaging on tobacco products from 1 December this year. And this isn't an isolated incident. It falls in part, uh, and as part of a long-term trend towards government encroaching on people's liberties and people's choices. And I'll take, for example, in the consumer product category. First it started with extra taxes, then it followed through with regulations, then it followed through with advertising restrictions, then it followed through in terms of product placement, etc., etc., etc. Now we're seeing exactly the same thing in alcohol, where we're seeing alcopop taxes, excise taxes, extra regulations, product placement restrictions, etc., etc., etc. And we know the British government is now consulting on plain packaging on alcohol. The same is occurring in food, or as the uh, public health socialist activists, uh, sociologists <coughs> like to call it EDNP, energy dense, nutrient poor food, which is basically sugary, salty, or fatty foods. And again, advertising restrictions, extra taxes or fat taxes. This of course is very heavily supported by political parties on the left like the Greens. And we are seeing exactly the same thing replicated. And it's shocked me recently when an editorial in that great bastion of freedom, I say that sarcastically, the Guardian newspaper in the UK proposed why not introduce plain packaging on fast food. It might interest people to know that there's actually been research done in the United States looking at the consequences of introducing plain packaging on fast food. So these things are replicated over a long period of time and unfortunately uh, the, the, the public health uh, community is using something like tobacco which is a product which has very serious health consequences as a market leader to justify what happens and it occurs incrementally over time. It starts with that product and then moves over to other ones. This is what Fabian socialism was always about. Incrementalism, accepting that the public would never allow for their basic freedoms to be restricted in one big heap. So what you do is do it over an incremental period of time, step by step, and think that nobody will notice. And clearly by being here tonight, you are aware of it, and you are noticing, and we're getting sick of it. But it doesn't just happen in the space of consumer products. What we're seeing, and I think Cass is going to go through this a lot more, is how government is encroaching on people's lives at every step. And we've done a lot of analysis looking at this in terms of local government regulation. How local governments are restricting access to street parties. So you can get together with your street and host a celebration for your street for whatever reason you see fit. We all know how increased obligations in terms of insurance are destroying civil society and community events. 
My grandmother used to make sandwiches for the CFA fighters during bushfires to make sure that they could be fed. Now they can't do it without incredible levels of labelling, which destroys civil society and means they have to bring in catering. This stuff has to stop. It has very real consequences. And the more you bring in government into the heart of people's lives, into the heart of the institutions of our democracy, the more you undermine the fabric of our democracy and of our civil society. And when you get away with that, then all you've got left is government and business. And as I regularly say to people, when you have big government and big business negotiating outcomes, it comes always at the expense of your freedoms. I think Mark Stein put it best, and I'll leave it on this quote, big government means small citizens. And that's what we're facing. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Tim. Um, for our next speaker, we're very happy to have with us Dr. Michael Keane, and especially because Dr. Michael Keane has agreed to be the Chief Academic Advisor for My Choice Australia. One of the things that we have been seeing more and more often in public debate is the dictate by science. People who are engaged in academia say, trust us, we're a scientist, we know what's best for you. I think many of us here would know about the problems, about the corruption of the scientific process in other areas. But this happens in every single sphere. And what we now see is, in public health especially, people, academics go and use the position of academia to try and propagate extreme left-wing policies on the public and say, well, trust me, I'm an academic. I mean, but the problem is most of them aren't actually, don't actually have any medical experience. Probably the biggest one of these, who the, the biggest pro-nanny state person in Australia, uh, Simon Chapman from the University of New South Wales, who receives you know, millions of dollars in taxpayer money, um, doesn't actually have a medical background. He says, I'm a doctor of public health. Um, yeah, his background is in sociology. Um, Dr. Michael Keane, however, is actually a doctor. He's a practicing anaesthetist. But he's also an adjunct associate professor at Swinburne University at the Centre for Human Psychopharmacology. And he's an adjunct lecturer uh, in public health at Marsh. So he actually, I think, has practicing medical experience, public health experience. And he's able to actually look at this from a scientific perspective and say, hang on, the science that you're trying to run all of our lives on, this actually isn't true. So we're really lucky to have Dr. Kane with us. And I'll Pass the microphone over to him. Thank you, Tim. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, you've got to have a bit of fun when you talk about public health. It's got to be a fun thing. You've got to have a bit of a laugh as well. But there is a serious side. Um, the idea of my choice, which is really the philosophical construct of liberty and the ethical and moral uh, construct of autonomy, has enabled the growth of Western civilization and the most dynamic and tolerant society in, the, in human history. And those who wish to usurp individual freedom are increasingly invoking a public health imperative. In, in particular, this includes the, what I say, irrational misapplication of the concepts of disease and addiction. The questions of choice, freedom, responsibility are necessarily ones of opinion, choice, and ultimately uh, philosophy. But unfortunately, public health can give the allure of science to what is otherwise a very narrow and intolerant ideology. And furthermore, the current politically correct, what I call race to the bottom, to remove any concepts of character and responsibility from our society, has the potential to create a far more destructive disease than alcohol, cigarettes and gambling combined. And indeed, we're already seeing this in, in an epidemic of lack of personal responsibility that's pervading our, our society. You could call it a severe cultural malaise. Now, just to have a bit of fun, I was thinking of an anthem that would summarise, summarise the contemporary intersection of my choice, public health and addiction. And perhaps Ian Jury's sex and drugs and rock and roll would be appropriate. Not only can you be addicted to drugs, supposedly sex, but now you can receive welfare for your heavy metal addiction, it seems. <laughs> and while the divinals describe a fine line between pleasure and pain, uh, it really is, in fact, a fine line between a modern-day public health advocate and a stalker. And, that, and that's why I think Sting's classic, I'll be watching you, is actually a nanny state anthem and manifesto. That's this, every breath you take, presumably smoking, every move you make, every single day, and every word you say, obviously any free speech. <laughs> I'll be watching you. And oh, can't you see, you belong to me. And that pretty much sums it up, isn't it? So why can't people 
make their own decisions. And it's often now because it's an addiction. Just about every dysfunctional behaviour can now be classified as addiction. Um, the American Society of Addiction Medicine has recently come out with a new definition of addiction. The short definition is addiction, and I quote, addiction is a primary chronic disease of brain reward, motivation, memory, and related circuitry. The long definition is over 2,800 words, and that's a long definition. But the crucial point is that it's being sold as a disease. And we're, see, we're seeing this disease model permeate not only our popular culture, but academia as well. Um, I recently saw an example of an, an addiction medicine specialist supposedly debunking myths related to addiction. And it was myth one, drug use is voluntary. So she was saying that was a myth. But this is akin to the first mantra of the 12 Steps program, which you may have heard of. It says, you must admit you are powerless to control your addiction. But that's simply not true. It's not backed up by psychiatric classifications. The issues regarding volition, fault, responsibility, culpability, harm, as they relate to drugs, alcohol, gambling, cigarettes, chocolate, sex, shopping, listening to heavy metal music, and many more, is a very complex one. And that's to say that it's a myth that drug use is voluntary, it's just a case of an opinion being presented as a scientific fact. You cannot just completely ignore the relevant disciplines of psychopharmacology, neuroethics, ethics, sociology, history and philosophy. And so the disease model is a highly unsophisticated assessment of the phenomenon. But it's very important to stress this one point. People suffering from addiction do suffer and can suffer immense disabling torment. And we must act compassionately. We do. We are a compassionate society. And in this regard, addiction is partly a disease, but ultimately, the people who do this behaviour, the addicts, do have the decision, do have the control to seek help or continue on what is sometimes a reckless and very selfish pathway. And they must be called out on that. So first and foremost, the disease model should be rejected because, to borrow a phrase from Antonin Scalia, it is intellectually hopelessly feeble. And God knows, we need some more Antonin Scalia's in public health. I think uh, Tim has mentioned a few on the opposite end of the spectrum. We need a few Antonin Scalia's in public health. But there's a more compelling reason to challenge the rise of the nanny state. If we conceptualise everything as, it's not my fault, it's my disease, it is reasonably foreseeable that this would lead to severe consequences to society, and we can see it already. Now, in preparing this talk, I was reviewing videos of violent assaults released by the police. And I just thought it was an absolute moral and intellectual outrage to just nihilistically attribute these acts to alcohol-related harm. I think that's just outrageous. And it's almost demonstrative of a cult to blame the evil god of alcohol without regard to the individual at fault. Now, I don't want my three girls growing up in a society where there is no individual responsibility. I don't want them living in a moral jungle where they can have their life ruined at any moment by an individual who just goes about whatever his urges say without any regard to responsibility, unrestrained by any societal pressure to take responsibility. It's not my fault, it's my disease is the mantra you hear. And I remember hearing that often when I was working in different places, especially in the East End of London. But um, it comes back to the concept that you are powerless. It's not my fault, it's my disease. But character is a function of the brain. Is that a disease? Compassion has a correlate in the brain. Is that a disease? Helping your fellow citizen is a function of the brain. Is that also a disease? Martin Luther King famously said, and I quote, and you all know the quote, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the colour of the skin, but by the content of their character. If we reduce everything about our, our behaviour and actions as the inevitable result of a disease, as many, many academics do, then we have completely debased the concept of character, and irrationally so. Um, a quick, to end up with, um, a quick little discussion of the London Olympics. I think they had a, a very important lesson for public health and the nanny state. And it's related to a much discussed study that you may have heard in the news recently related to alcohol restriction in Newcastle, 
that's been put forward by many academics. And I'll read you from that to the study. It says, the findings are consistent with the availability hypothesis, namely that increasing the physical and or economic availability of alcohol increases consumption and therefore alcohol-related harm. So in that regard, this is probably how a public health advocate would uh, relate to the Josh Booth incident. The, peop the people of London should be ashamed. They failed a vulnerable young Aussie by not advocating 6 p.m. lockouts, by not mandating warning labels, <laughs> by not enforcing strict responsible alcohol serving, the people of London were conspiring enablers of big alcohol <laughs> to peddle their killer product. Josh Booth was another in a long line of innocent Aussie victims of the epidemic of alcohol-related harm. All this because London didn't prevent our Josh from having a drink or two. I hope and suspect that the UK government will offer Josh a generous compensation package for the damage that they let him cause to those unfortunate shop windows. <laughs> to finally finish off with, I'll just, I'll just to give you an idea of the, the, the current flavour in academic public health, the following is an extract from a commentary in the Medical Journal of Australia. And quote, and this was last year, in theory, Allowing people to make their own choices about purchasing products unfettered by a nanny state sounds fine. However, this assumes that consumers can make informed, rational choices. It go, and then he goes on to say, in practice, humans are far from rational. You can just imagine Sir Humphrey Appleby saying, Minister. Minister. Humans are far from rational. But yet this makes it into the academic journals. But of course, the unambiguous translation of that is that you are too stupid. You, sir, are too stupid. We are all just too stupid. Um, thank you so much for, your, uh, for coming today. It's lovely to see you all. Um, I want to finish off by saying that we are on the right side of history, but we still need people like Tim to help put these ideas forward. And I hope you'll join Tim in this wonderful new organisation that he's starting. Thank you very much. We, we, um, our previous two speakers both spoke about public health primarily. But in terms of the issue of personal responsibility and actually learning, you know, we need to take responsibility for our actions, not blame others, not say, oh, my, a disease made me do it. Actually, no, learn to be accountable for our actions. A lot of this does come from upbringing and from childhood. And one of the things that I've been interested in for the last couple of years has been um, looking at what the government has now done to try and you know, prevent kids from being kids. Um, in my, some of my spare time, I actually used to do some work in the scout trip as a leader recently, and I grew up in that. And I, and I know recently, you know, we wanted to do all these activities that you know, even I was doing 10 years ago, I said, no, can't do that, illegal, you know, OHS laws. Uh, insurance can't do it. So all of these activi activities are no longer allowed because of the nanny state. And what you start thinking is, if you have an entire generation of people who aren't taught about risk management, who aren't allowed to go and play ground equipment because they might graze their knee, what does this mean about society? There was a case a few weeks ago, in Bri a few months ago in Brisbane, where two girls were playing tennis, and the thir a 13-year-old girl was hit with a tennis ball, she got a bruise, so her parents sued the school. There was a case um, in Sydney about a month ago where a, a, a tree house was shut down because, I kid you not, I, this was the reason given, um, there might be bugs in it. <laughs> and, I mean, what does this do to an entire generation when, who need to, you know, of kids who need to learn things about personal responsibility and risk management. And well, this is why I'm really excited to hear our next, have our next speaker here, who's come here from Sydney. Um, Cass Wilkinson is a um, commentator now at The Australian. She's an author of the book Don't Panic and Things Are Getting... Nearly everything you know, is better than you think. Nearly everything is better than you think. <laughs> um, she was a former advisor to Labor Premier in New South Wales, Christina Keneally. She's a frequent commenter on the media. I think she's been on the Bolt Report recently. <laughs> um, I think we actually had um, both Cass and Tim Wilson on the Bolt you Report did. last week. Um, 
And I and but the thing is, one of the things Cass has written about, I think more than anyone else in Australia, has been this very issue about how what it, about you know letting kids be kids and being unsupervised and the implications this has for adults. So I'm really excited to have Cass here and I'll give the microphone over to her. Thank you. Thank you. Terribly nice of all of these people to give me reasons to come to Melbourne and hang out with my new friend Tim. Um, I, uh, as some of you know, I come from a labour background, many generations old, from coal mining stock in the UK. Um, but I came slowly towards a more libertarian perspective because I started a radio station. Um, I was in a band at a young age, and uh, and as the venues suffered in Sydney and. For a number of reasons, we decided to start a great radio station, and I, I could compare notes with you on human pharmacology at some stage, but certainly the, the libertarian streak in rock and roll is very strong. And rock and roll, unlike most arts, uh, is not well regarded by government, so it, it's free of all of the constraints that come with public funding. It's very entrepreneurial. Uh, it's what my uh, co-founder of FBI describes as anarcho-capitalism. So I... Uh, while I was working in the Labor Party, I was uh, building this uh, million dollar a year turnover, completely community funded civil society project. And I, because the government wouldn't help us, which um, as a young socialist surprised me, <laughs> I had to go and ask people for money. And, um, and so we got advertisers and supporters and we, we borrowed the money and paid back a million dollars that it took us to set the business up and um, sometimes I can't believe we got it done but it's always left me with a legacy of believing that civil society is the best solution wherever possible to social goals. Um, but I must say, if, if I thought rock and roll was difficult, and I have faced people, by the way, as recently as two weeks ago who said, you should apologise for Thomas Kelly's death on King's Cross because uh, our radio station started a music venue in King's Cross. So we run a nightclub, um, we trade till dawn. Currently the council and the government are putting together laws to shut us down at one. <laughs> um, which similarly, the reason I came to be aware of the IPA was because the IPA were the only people standing up for rock and roll when the Victorian government shut down the tote through having all of the outrageous extra laws on security, um, early closures, the amount of business regulation that affects rock and roll is extraordinary. So it, it sort of, I guess, turned me capitalist after a while. But if I thought that being a rock and roller would turn me libertarian, I had no idea how much would happen when I became a mum. And uh, you would think that becoming a mum would make you a good person in the eyes of the state. And after that, that you know, no one would ask you about your human pharmacology and they could get on with thanking you for making the world a better place. And, I can start every se sentence with, as a mum, uh, you know, in fact, I, I am a lesser ambassador of gastrointestinal cancer awareness at the moment, <laughs> the Gutsy Kids Challenge, which I went to, and uh, at one point, the facilitator, after explaining that it wasn't a trendy cancer like breast cancer, but cancers of the gut are important, uh, said kids have to eat vegetables, and she went to pains to say, I don't think anyone's here to blame parents for how kids eat. And I said, I, uh, I, I am. <laughs> um, uh, you don't go to work in your pyjamas. You don't drive your car around with leaded petrol in it. Uh, and yet when people have children, they say, there's no instruction manual. I mean, I got an education to do my job and I pay my mortgage every month, but the intense responsibility of being a human, somehow it didn't occur to me that I should, you know, maybe read a book, <laughs> ask some other people for advice or help. And the amount of effort and expense that the government goes to to excuse bad parents from becoming good parents is extraordinary. But what's more surprising is the effort they go into preventing good parents from being good parents. Go to a local park to get your kids some exercise. After Nicola Roxon's told you you're all too fat, you know, okay, put down the butter. While my low pack is still legal, I do keep butter in my house and feed it to my children <laughs> regularly. <laughs> We have, uh, we have a whole shelf of chocolate in our pantry and uh, both my kids are thin and healthy and they can both throw a mean punch, they do karate. And uh, 
A girlfriend of mine rang me the other day and she said, I just wanted to ring you and then I thought I shouldn't ring you because this shouldn't be weird, but I just ran into your children walking home unaccompanied. <laughs> and she said, that's mad, right? That should be normal. You shouldn't ring your friend and go, wow, I saw your primary school age children just walking home from school by themselves. But my niece and nephew, who do the same thing, who ride their bike, my sister-in-law and brother-in-law have been called by the school six times. They've been summoned to the school. They've had to talk to the principal about how irresponsible it is for them to let their children ride their bikes home after school. And we've had cases <laughs> in, in Australia recently. We had uh, two mums in Queensland taken to court and fined for leaving their, their children above 1 8, 1 11, leaving them home for more than four hours by themselves. I confess, I left my children 11 and 5 home by themselves for two hours while I went to a party next door, <laughs> which I didn't realise was totally illegal, apparently. But I used to babysit other kids when I was 11, and I figured my 11 year old daughter could babysit my son, it's in our house. And Anyway, so it's illegal to leave your children by themselves, although the law is fuzzy beyond belief on this point. Up to age of 14. <laughs> so it's also illegal to skateboard home out after dark in Queensland. Uh, it's illegal, of course, as we all know, to ride a bike without a helmet, although like how many of us used to ride our BMX bikes around all over the place. And as was pointed out to me today when I said, wow, what great bikes in Melbourne, people said, well, no one rides them because you have to have a helmet. <laughs> So, on top of which, every playground, do you remember rockets? And you look around now and you go, where did rockets go? It's actually not an accident that there aren't any rockets in the playground anymore. There's a group called Kids Safe, self-appointed safety nutters, who formed themselves a lobby group, and they lobbied the government, and now the Australian standards for trampolines, rockets, slippery dips, God help you if you can find a merry-go-round. I, I know of one in Sydney. <laughs> and, and when you go through the reasoning in the uh, research that they've done, the reason that rockets are unsafe is because it's too difficult for parents to get into the top of them. <laughs> Which, you're not supposed to be there. Do you know one of the leading causes of hip and leg injuries in children in the United States now is um, parents insisting on having their children ride slippery dips on their lap. So. It, <laughs> A child can't really hurt themselves on a slippery slide, but if, if a parent who's too big for it sits underneath them, then what tends to happen on the bottom, a kid's leg gets jammed between the parent's leg and the edge of the slippery slide, and then they both fall off and it twists the kid's ankle, breaks their legs. It's actually incredibly dangerous to be that stupid and overprotective. So, so, and then, um, when my son's school, and a bright yellow slippery dip it was literally this high, evil slippery dip. And they ripped it up. That, well, first of all, they, they put wood across it, dangerous. And I said, oh, what's the go with the slippery slide? Oh, it's, it's very dangerous. Two, two kids have fallen off and broken their arms. And I said, well, <laughs> that, that seems like a strange little cluster effect here. Um, but nonetheless, most kids are not going to break their arms. This seems a bit silly. Um, back and forth with the teachers, with the principal, with the school board. Finally, I ended up writing a 5,000 word research uh, essay to the principal, uh, which is where I learned about rockets and merry-go-rounds and <laughs> all the rest of it, saying, please, how is my son going to be able to know not to get in the boot of a car and drive down the Kominara Parkway at 15? How is he going to know not to climb over a fence after six beers at 17? How is he going to be able to assess any risk at all and grow up into a man who can face the zombie apocalypse well prepared <laughs> if you won't even let him slide down a three foot high plastic slippery dip? And everyone on the parents board and teachers and friends parents say, yes, the safety culture is getting really out of hand, isn't it? And I said, well, it's just too stressful for the teachers to have to worry that the kids might hurt themselves. <laughs> so it then became an OHS stress issue for the teachers. <laughs> so they, they got rid of it. So there's no slippery dip in the playground anymore. And the, 
These are, these are the kinds of things where you think, and then you wonder why the first chance a 15 year old gets to get away from you and be unsupervised, they drink 16 beers and put their bum on the internet. <laughs> where were the formative experiences? Where were the scout trips? Where were the rope bridges? Where were the flying foxes? You know, when I was 10, I came home one afternoon to find several police officers and most of our neighbours looking for me and my friend and my dog because it was after dark and uh, we'd been rowing across the lake on a boat that we made out of polystyrene we found at a nearby factory. <laughs> and, uh, and the thing that I remember most looking back on it was that nobody started looking for us until it got dark. But we'd been out since seven o'clock in the morning. And that's what eight, nine and ten year old kids, I mean, you know, looking most of you here are my age, possibly slightly older, many of you, you remember that being unsupervised, unsupervised, remember how awesome being unsupervised was as a kid? And that's when you had to work things out with your brothers and sisters and your friends, that's where you couldn't say, but mum, you couldn't dob on anyone, you, know? <laughs> you had to work out how to solve your own problems. And often in quite difficult circumstances that you never told any adults about later because then they'd worry. <laughs> and the weird thing is that at the moment as adults, we're not allowed to be unsupervised either. And I look now at the media regulations, I look at the CCTV rolling out everywhere, I look at the government's current proposal to have all of your online records held for two years. Every email you write, all of the websites that you might have a look at from time to time, Keep that preserved for two years so that literally nothing you do online is unsupervised. And then we think about the amount of time that we spend in the workplace, on public transport, anywhere in private life even now, given that the government wants to tell me what I can feed my children, <laughs> wants to tell me whether I can let them come home from school by themselves. I think the idea of being unsupervised is absolutely fundamental to taking our place as grown adults. And the reason I'm so passionate about letting my children be unsupervised is because I know that's how they'll grow up into adults who are capable of making all the decisions they need to make without looking to someone else to solve their problems for them. And I think we're all here because we agree that the learned dependency that sits underneath all of these rules is what we're all really afraid of. And you know, in a, a country that's prepared to say, well, First they came for the shooters, you know, but I wasn't a shooter. I thought, oh, yeah, I've met a few of those people who hunt pigs, <laughs> frankly. You know, <laughs> no, that's such a bad idea. And we, we, know, we used to have those things where we'd say, you know, and, and then who's next after that? And these used to be sort of abstract arguments. And then last week in New South Wales, they watered down the right to silence. You know, and there's, 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 there's points where you go, wow, that was fast. <laughs> that, uh, that, that went really quickly from internet filter to Finkelstein to watering down the right to silence. And it didn't take decades. And the history of the world and the history of brave and free countries is not linear. You know, countries go from being unfree to free very often, but they also go from being free to being unfree. And I think every one of us is here because you don't want to wake up one day and go from being Egypt in the 70s to being Egypt last week. <laughs> um, and I think that it's really, it's, it's, we can all be grateful to Tim for uh, giving us a place to express those anxieties and giving us a, I guess, a, a vehicle through which we can organise ourselves and do something about this. So thank you all for coming and thank you, Tim. One of the things that I think really stands to it out of our three speakers is um, it doesn't necessarily matter where you are on the political fence right now. We have, and I know, you know I've corresponded with many of you via email, we have some different political opinions, we come from different political traditions. But what it comes down to at the moment is that we can all agree that we just don't want government bureaucrats running our lives. We are in a situation right now where we have a choice. Who knows what's best for us and our families? Do we know what's best 
or does a, paper, a pencil pusher in Canberra know what's best? Does a government bureaucrat have the right to regulate what we eat, what we drink, what we see, how we raise children, what games kids can play? Do bureaucrats and international organisations have the right, with no democratic mandate, to impose what they think we should do upon us? The history of the last hundred years and the fight against communism, in, you know, if you look in Eastern Europe, has been a fight about the power of the individual against government control. For most of the 20th century, we had communism as an ideology whereby we had people saying, the government should run all of your finances for you. The government, should, the state should run your life. The state should do all of these things for you. That failed rather spectacularly. But you still see this controlling zealotry amongst the hard left but they've just shifted tactics a bit. Rather than saying, well, we're the economists, we know what's best. They say, well, we're the scientists, we know what's best. We're the public health academics, we know what's best. We've, I, have a mass, I have a PhD in raising kids. I never raised them myself, but I have a PhD, you know? <laughs> so I know what's best for your kids. This is the mentality that we're up against at the moment. And more importantly, we have millions and millions of dollars in taxpayer money, our hard-earned money, going to fund all of these groups. We, it's time for us to start pushing back against this. Even if it's an unpopular cause. I know, you know our first speaker, Tim spoke, uh, Wilson, spoke about the, you know, the, the, the tobacco industry, which I recognise you know, might be the most popular industry. But as he said, the tenet of, of Fabian socialism has been incrementalism. You pick the most unpopular target, and then you gradually go a little bit further, a little bit further, a little bit further, until all of our liberties are uh, destroyed in the process. And that's what we're saying. So look, thank you everyone for coming here today. I want to specifically thank all of our three speakers um, so for doing such a great job. So thank you. And I want to thank everyone else who's helped organising this event. I'm Siobhan, wherever you are, for all of your help uh, with the venue and other such things. So thank you, wherever you are. Um, Helen, thank you for the video. The people who helped fix the banner when it broke, thank you. And look, thank you everyone for coming here today. Look, one of the things I just want to leave you on is, uh, we specifically chose an informal venue. We chose to come here to have a bar, uh, at a bar, so we could all get to know each other. I've always thought, you know, there's no point just going here with some speakers and going home, because you don't actually achieve anything. You achieve change by actually building a community of people. This is the thing the left doesn't realise. The left have always gone out and actually said, well, you know, you need a big government to run everyone's lives. No. True community comes from individuals working together. That's what we are here today. We came here voluntarily. So please stay. Meet the people who are around you. Make friends. Make contacts. Because none of us are alone in this fight. We all believe in this. We all believe that our future lies in freedom and not government control. So let's all work together and actually take back our freedoms. Thank you.